Was that you or her? Uh -huh. Okay. So again, it's like the subtle. What are you saying, though? Like the strength. I mean, you're a female. He's a male. But besides that, you were you squeezed it pretty tight. I think. Okay, although I did tell you my grip strength really is 20 pounds. Try it again. A normal grip strength for an adult female should be about 40 pounds. Okay, the guy is about 80 to 100. Okay, what else? 40. Even though it might not be part of this, and we did talk about the vestibular, could you check? Balance. Standing balance. Who said that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so how would you check them? standing balance? I try to push. Well, you could check sitting balance too. Go ahead, push me. Push me over. Push me. Don't let me. Don't push, push me. me. Okay. Do it again. Do it a couple Same times. Side? Yeah. Wherever. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Do the other side. Oh, you're stronger. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I just noticed that. Yeah. I don't know why. Okay? Do him. So one time you get to put oh, the teacher over. Oh, you can sit or stand. Yeah. Oh, do, just, do it sitting and standing. Take out your aggression. Yeah. Push him over. Push him. <laughs> do the other side. <laughs> <laughs> don't play him yourself. Put your hands in your lap, cheater. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You, he was like this, you know? No fair. Okay. All right. So standing in? Same? We're both okay? Yeah. So Except for your One side time. was a little different, so you don't know why. And you did it twice, and it was a little different. And you're like, mm, okay. Just put it in the back of your mind. Do standing. Okay? So you have people put their hands across their chest so they can't use their arms. Okay? Okay, go to the other side. Oops, so I went out of my base of support. Do it again. Same. Okay. But was one side different than the other? Yeah. This side What happened here? Yeah, yeah, I kind of did this. Yeah. I don't know what's up with that. Do him. You're also looking for postural sway back and forth, like when you just watch people. Do they do this kind of thing? Or sway side to side? Which is hard to observe sometimes. You gotta push hard. He ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> I use more for it. Okay. She's, she, had, she had a running start. Yeah. All right. <laughs> also, I mean, you kind of want to see people walk, right? Yeah. What would be normal? One, one, one is standing. Let's do the Romberg. Okay. Go ahead. Romberg test. What's that? Okay. Check oh, your yeah. screening book. Yeah. 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 Oh, you have to close your eyes and I can push you over? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now you're taking away the vision as a helper to balance. Oh, there we go. Okay. That would be the same. It's the same. Yeah. Okay, it should be a little less with your eyes closed, right? Right. right. You almost take it away. Yeah. There's three faculties for balance. Your proprioception, your vision, and your inner ears. Right? So by making people close their eyes, you're taking yeah, away one of those faculties, yeah. right? Yeah. Hey, okay. Did you see my comment? All right, do him. On your picture. Nope, solid. Okay. All right, what else? <laughs> what else? Gate. Yeah. Okay. So, I, lots of times I like to see people turn and pivot because that's where they'll lose their balance. So I'll just say, walk up to that book and turn and come back. Lots of times, too, there's something called the time to get up and go. You can see people get up off a chair without using their arms. Get up, go, and come back. And you could, there is a time norms, but in a clinical situation, you just kind of watch them, okay? Sometimes, too, if you really think someone has vestibular problems, take away their vision and say, as you walk down the hall, I want you to call out what you're seeing along the hall. I see periodic tables, I see a telephone, I see a uh, Kelly, I see an Alicia, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you're sort of taking away 
one of the faculties. And if they start calling stuff out and they lose their balance, you go, ooh, something's not right there. Those are people who can't walk and chew gum at the same time. People can't talk or chew gum. My husband has a hard time. He can't talk and drive. Yes. So there is a reason. Well, remember, who has the bigger corpus callosums and who can multitask? Women. That's why we're the moms. He said the driving. Your husband. Yes, but he has primitive reflexes. Every time he reaches in the back of the car, his AT&R comes in and the steering wheel goes with him. Irma too, so she's a girl. It's not just a guy-girl thing. But you also will see it more often in the elderly. And when people are fatigued, those primitive reflexes come out more. No, what did you say almost, that? What did you say that was? Uh, asymmetrical tonic neck reflex. And like kids with CP, they're stuck in it. That reflex never integrates for them, and that just dominates all their movement, unfortunately. So it's why they may never have real good quality movement. Okay, yeah, any? In the elderly, you will see really that, you know, what you're saying, you know, cannot walk and chew gum. Yeah. They can't. Yeah. And you will see them, you know, in your offices, when you will see somebody, you know, 80 years old or whatnot, and they'll be walking and they'll, they'll try to tell you something. And they stop. And they stop and yeah. turn around. Mm. You know, in my office, I see it all the time. So they walk, you know, if there's a narrow passage and they walk in front of me and I'm in a hurry. And they just go and say, oh, and I forgot to tell you. Like slowing you down. So what I do is I try to sneak by them and going in front of them so they can see me and maybe the speed up. But they will do it. Literally, you will see it all the time. When they will talk, they will walk very slowly and then they will talk. Turn around yeah. and talk. Because they cannot talk while they're walking. What, what would be some other, he kind of just did a walking like that. Kind of well, yeah, the shuffling gait would be a problem. Like dragging. Okay, so one foot dragging might be indicative of what? Foot drop? Okay. What else, what, what would this be indicative of? Don't CP do that a lot? Well, yeah, if you're, yeah, okay. Maybe a stroke, but also on hiking Rigidity. one hip. You can check. This is called so the yeah. trendal, yes. break. You ask them to stand on one on one leg, okay? And when you stand on one leg, what's happening to your hips? When you stand on the one leg, shifted. 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 Which way? To the opposite. To the other okay. Way. So this going up, right? Right. Yeah. You know, and these people with trendal break, they will stand on one leg and they will go like this. Collapse. Yeah. And this will collapse. It's not normal. Because anybody who's standing on you know on one on, on one you know on one leg, the other hip should go up. And with them you'll see going down. What's that called? That's called the Trendalenberg. T R E N D E L E N B E R G. Is that the gluteal drop? Is that the same as that the gluteal drop or whatever it is? I think we're gonna have to talk about it next week. Yes. You know, it's, it's in my notes. Yeah. Yes. It's like a sign. It's a, you know. But then they'll say they have a Trendelenburg gait. Because you see that dropping of the hip. Yeah. When they walk. Now, but you could, you're right, that asymmetrical gait could be indicative of a stroke or something else, too. It's, you, but but you'd have to do that test to know is it a Trendelenburg thing. Okay, what else? What else on the neuro exam? I mean, just because you say your proprioception, I mean, wouldn't you still check for it? Would you still check? Do I know where I am in space? Well, you did something that you checked, like you made me close my eyes when I was standing. Okay. So it's pretty so obvious. You only go further if you see. Right, right. Why? Well, you kind of. Okay. You don't have any reason to believe that my proprioception is out of whack. Okay. And like when you told me, hold your arms up, I kind of knew where they were in okay. space. But if right? you didn't, that's when you would say. Yes, close your way. eyes. Which way am I positioning okay. your arm? Okay. And if I know somebody had a stroke that it affected their parietal lobe, well, then their proprioception is going to be out of whack. Okay. So I would just do a couple positions to confirm that okay. or deny it. 
Yeah. What about uh, steering con or steering Stereognosis. Okay, so you have any objects I could hold on to? And you got some money? <laughs> Who's my school supply queen here? Put some objects in my hand. Who has some money here? Oh, all she has. Okay, so put Usually something you have in to my pay hand. The doctor. Uh -huh. you, yeah. the doctor doesn't have to pay you. Okay, this is a money? this is a pen and it's got a rubber thingy grippy. Give me something else. Oh, this is an eraser, I think. Go ahead, give me something here. Okay, this is like a quarter, I think. This is a paper clip, so I'm fine. Okay? Good. Sometimes, too, like I'll, you know, and usually if somebody's like me and you think they're fine, don't tell them what it is. But if you think they're a little slower with their faculties, you might lay them out on the table and say, I'm going to be putting these in your hand. You have to tell me what they are now. Close your eyes. So they don't, you know, you don't want to do that when you first meet somebody and say, close your eyes because they're going to think you're a freak. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you have no reason to believe that they have something wrong that might be asymmetrical, but usually just for safety's sake, I check both sides. Because you never know. I mean, I could have a carpal tunnel over there that's not related to this vision weakness thing, right? And carpal tunnel is dysfunction of which nerve? Median. No better nerve, this. Yeah. Median nerve. Okay. Two point discrimination. Yeah, you need you the can calipers. Use a pen. Did she? Well, what did I do the other day? I took a paper clip and unfolded it. Yeah, she could take a paper clip and a ruler if you didn't have the tool. I well, just, don't, just don't poke it. You just yeah. do it sideways. Right. Don't right. poke it. Oh. <laughs> okay. Who volunteers? Give me your paper clip. Can I, yeah. can I undo your paper sure. clip? Okay, so I always undo it here, and then, well, you kind of don't have two here, but you might want to break it. You know what I mean? And then you have two points there, if God forbid you don't have the device. You could just see, because in the fingertips, right, I should be able to feel about that distance support. I better be. I'm not going to break your paper, yeah, but now that I bent it. Oh, well, I could just do this. Do the whole thing. How about that? Yes. There we go. Okay? Tell me one or two. One or two. Somebody do it. Come on, Mary Claire. So the exact measurement between the two tips, is that something that needs to be... Well, I mean, if you have the two-point caliper, even better, so you go one or two. Remember, it's in the... It, you yeah. know, like in the back, it would be like about two, two and a half inches. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, on the hand would be... I think it's two. All right, one or two. What? One or two. I think it was one. One or two. I know two. they're not perfectly even. Two. You got it. Okay. So you see that? All right, you got to close your eyes. And with the caliper, I mean, that's what you... You would report that number. Okay. But this is really screening, real rough screening. Okay, what else? Oh, mm. what's that called? Uh, you tied it with what? This. this. Diadochokinesis. Remember that's your big word. Cokinesis. Okay. Coke. All right. So somebody tell me what to do, Corey. Yeah, but the patient doesn't know what the hell pronation supination is. <laughs> you, can, you can show them what to do. Okay, touch your nose and do what? Just switch. Go back. No. Point this. Oh, yeah. It's not this because that is easier than this. Okay? And this is not just rapid alternating movements. This is about ataxia and dysmetria. So this is more cerebellar, you know, okay, so if I miss more than an inch and I'm shaky, you think cerebellar. And if I can't do it and I start doing this, 
you think, ooh, both sides of the brain ain't working together. This is a bilateral motor coordination problem. So people who can't do this, like me? I can't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, no. Right. Okay, there you go. You've worked on it. Right? You can tell. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what about where you, where you, you image somebody else doing something else? So the mirror image yeah. of somebody? Yeah. Copy me? Yeah, so I okay. I should do this, not this. Right. What? Or I guess this or that. I don't know. How would you do? That's yeah. just motor planning, right? Yeah. I mean, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, I do want to say there is two types of motor planning. Okay. Pra the word praxis. Do you all know this term, praxis? Okay. There is idiomotor apraxia to be without praxis and ideational apraxia. Okay, to check for ideational praxis, you say, Corey Samples, show me how a boxer stands. Oh, uh, yeah, do no, it. I don't know do how it. A boxer Corey, put your dukes up. Thank you. Okay, she should go something like this. That means she has the idea of how a boxer stands. That's more of a linguistic function. And she can enact the motor action. Corey, show me how you say stop. Okay? Corey, comb your hair. Okay? That is a linguistic function. Okay? If someone has a stroke, I always check this. Okay? Particularly people who have a stroke that affects their language area. I'll say, Alicia, show me how you comb your hair. Okay? Then, if I just want to know, and you do fine on that, okay, when it, you, you probably can also copy my movements. Mm -hmm. okay. So, idiomotor apraxia is when they can't even execute the movement. Okay. Idiomotor. So, they have the idea, but they can't do the action. That's more of a motor problem. That's a frontal lobe problem. Okay? Whereas not having the idea, or like people who have strokes, you hand them that pen and you say, what do you do with that? And they start brushing their teeth with it. You're like, oh, we have some problems here. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right? That's a linguistic problem. And also for the stroke, somebody post-stroke, you want to check their memory. So you name three, sub three objects and tell them to, mem you know, to remember it and repeat it when you ask them. So you can say... Pencil, cat, window. Remember these words. And then you, you, you go on with something else for like five minutes and say, what, what was the words I, I told you to remember? And see if they can recall it. Yeah, I know. Pencil, cat, window. Yes. When I was um, ice shadowing, they, they, well, in their eval, they made them draw a clock. Yes. Okay. And, and this is in chapter 17 or 18 in your book. Um, and so what you'll see with people with hemiplegia or dyspraxia too, I mean, they will draw the clock and they will put all the numbers 1 through 12, believe it or not, like that. And you'll tell them, make the clock say 3 o'clock. And they will actually do something like this and they will... You know, I mean, they're kind of, I mean, it's not really 3 o'clock, but the long hand is on the 12. And so, you know they know what 3 o'clock is, but this is clearly someone who has hemianopsia probably. Okay? They're not seeing out of both halves of each eye. So this is someone who's not seeing this part of the world. So even though I've got a visual problem... I'm seeing both halves of my world. This would be a worse problem than I have. So does anybody have a diagnosis for me? Ptosis. Well, ptosis is the symptom. P-T-O-S-I-S. Ptosis is the symptom. It's an eyelid droop. And I actually have slings in my eyes. So I have, so right now I think I'm opening my eyes really wide. Am I? Pretty normal. They're wider than usual. Uh, because my eyebrows are working. 
But my eyes, they might be a little more, but watch this. Now they open. So if I walk around like this, I can see. <laughs> because I have slings in my head that keep my eyes open. If I didn't have these slings, my eyes would be in my visual field, my eyelid. So it's more... Th they're like silicone or something, so I could say, hey, I got silicone, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Which that's the only place I have it, right. <laughs> but it's more than just a cranial nerve issue because of your muscle strength. Amen, right. sister. Good, so you're using good deduction. This is more than cranial nerves. Mm -hmm. And is it really a cranial nerve problem? Because the cranial nerves kind of work. Out of the so you, you say the signals are so, but what else could cause weakness? Does it have to be a nerve problem? Mm -hmm. What could it be? Track problem. Inhib in okay, so inhibition. it could be a biochemical problem, which kind of affects the nerves. Right. Neuromodulators. Okay, well, there, you're still on the chemical thing. Could be a side effect of the medication. Okay, it could be a side effect. Nobody's asked me what medications yeah, what I take. Medication oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I take um, that proamatine for heart rate. I also take um, thyroid, an armor thyro. Not not synthroid, but it's a more natural I mean it's still doctors prescribe it. For hypo or hypothyroidism, which is also associated with eye droop, but apparently that's not the reason I have eye droop, or maybe it's double reason why I have eye droop. What else could be the problem? Yes, it could be a chemical, it could be a nerve conduction problem. But what else could go wrong that someone could be weak? Blood flow? Maybe blood flow, which I, I think I'm okay there. And maybe an is, I don't know, ischemia or something like that? Yeah, that would be a blood flow problem. Right. I think I'm okay there. Are you like a. What'd you say? Depression. Uh, maybe. And for a while, a daughter was depressed. So I. Well, okay, so I kept going to the doctor going. I'm not depressed. I'm not depressed. And then, uh, you know, the doctor was like, oh, well, maybe you're perimenopausal. You know, try soy, try this, try that. And then I went to a psychologist, and I was like, my husband, oh, I was like hypersensitive to smells. I mean, crazy, lunatic, hypersensitive to smells. And my husband was like, you're just crazy. And so I was like, okay, I am crazy. I'm going to a counselor. So I went to a counselor, and he diagnosed me with hypothyroidism. And then I, so what I did, I went to my doctor, and I got all my lab values for the last five years that I had been going to that same doctor complaining. I have no energy. I'm just like, blah. And I put it on an Excel spreadsheet, and I graphed it. My labs were still within the normal values, though. So that's why the doctor didn't prescribe medicine. But when I can show him the graph the trend, is going yeah. up and up and up, or down, yeah, up, like my thyroid was like, I think the normal is, what, 5.4 or something, you know, to be called hypo. I was like, one year, 4 point something, the next year, 4.7, the next year, 5.1. 5.2 so each year it was creeping up and at the same time I went to a neurologist and I was like I'm weak my balance and he was like well try effects or maybe you're just depressed and I did and it didn't do anything probably except make me more crazy than I already am I don't know the, first, the very first thing that you want to check you know anytime you know if there's a blood work or any medication whatever thyroid yep it's a, it's a main metabolic hormone. Okay. When I have somebody who is, you know, depressed and no problem otherwise, blood pressure is fine, everything is fine, everything is fine, and I, I need to put them on, you know, on medication, like Effexos or whatever, right. 
uh, before I do that, I always check the thyroid. Thank you. Because your... if I don't check the thyroid, I don't know how quickly she will metabolize the medication or how slowly. Anyway, right. Yeah. And this way I can either overdose or underdose her. So I want to make sure that her metabolism is okay, and then I can prescribe the normal dose. Okay, let me tell you the other medicines I take, which are not medicines, they are supplements. I take 800 milligrams of CoQ10 every day. I take, write this down, these are five, five supplements that I take in concert with each other, presumably. I don't know all the dosages, but 800 CoQ10. Riboflavin, what is that, B12 or B2? No, B2. B2. Riboflavin, alpha lipoic acid, creatine, and acetyl carnitine. Something with the muscle fight. That's all I yeah. Go, girl. Muscles. Keep yeah, going. Yeah, baby. She said that's something with the muscle. Okay? So, what could be wrong with a muscle? That people don't have energy. So de de oh, No, no, it's uh, mitochondria. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The energy. Fibromyalgia. Okay. Not fibromyalgia, huh? So what do the mitochondria do? Okay, they make ATP. So they are the storehouse for energy in the muscles. Okay. What diagnosis might cause mitochondrial dysfunction and droopy eyes. I mean, look it up. Google it. Well, what con there's a name. There's a couple di diagnoses that are mitochondrial disorders that affect eye muscles. And you have it in one of the handouts that I posted. Duchenne's would be muscular dystrophy. And that's men. That's a boy disease. Yeah. If you, if, you, if you look yeah. at our, you Kern know, at the, the files that we posted, is there. Kern Sayer syndrome? Yeah. That's close, yeah. Horners? Horners is another one that affects eye droop. Supposedly, I don't have that either. How do you suspect yeah. they knew whether I had a mitochondrial disorder? How do they even diagnose that? That was not blood. You can't tell By from the blood. Exclusion. Well, I mean, yeah, you could uh, by power of deduction, but how do doctors a, know? Hook you up to a, um, I forget what it's called. Something electric. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what they do first. They just like you guys said. Is it a nerve problem? The first thing they look at is a chemical problem. Remember, they did that tensilon test. Like, well, it ain't that. It's not a, who said that? That's it. CPEO is what I have. Okay? Chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. And this article, actually, you have, you know, I posted in the yeah. files, in, and the, in, the, in the campus. Kern Sayer syndrome is like a version of it. And they've never told me I had that. They were like, well, you just have CPEO. But go back. So first they said it's not chemical. Then Alicia's right. They maybe do two things. A nerve conduction study where they shock you. And the whole time, you know, me with my little profanity, I'm like, ha! <laughs> and, you know, I'll say to the doctor, like, sorry, you know. And he's like, I know, it hurts, I know, shut up, you know. Anyway, but that was a, what they called a subclinical study. So he was like, mm, you're kind of normal, you're a little bit under normal, but it's still a normal study. And then... <coughs> And they did an EMG, too, and I was fine there. But the nerve conduction was, like, just slightly. So then they were like, oh, now we need to do another test to see. So if you're looking at muscles, what do you need to look at? Uh, yeah, so how do you check? A, okay, if you've checked it electrically and you're still not sure, now what do you need? 
They've checked it clinically. They kind of, yeah. So now we need a piece of muscle. So they got to take it out of you, and they freeze it, and they check the mitochondria is what they do. So they, and they're looking for red, ragged fibers is what they're looking for. And I had red, ragged fibers. And so, but it took me, this took years to get this diagnosis. And me keep going back saying, oh, I'm just not right. I'm not depressed. I'm just, you know, part of this, I think, was the thyroid the whole time, too. Because I feel that it improved as the thyroid improved. But my eye muscle weakness has not changed. It's, and I have to go for revisions of the slings every couple of years and it get them relifted. Is hypothyroidism, is that where the eyes... They, they droop do. as well. Yeah. So now you've got two reasons why. So did the hypothyroidism cause the mitochondrial or no? Or do we have two problems going on at once? I think two problems. Yeah, okay. And this is why it's so hard for doctors to diagnose people because we're complicated oh, beings. Yeah. What else do you know about mitochondrial disorders? Which is why they told me it's not my father. See, I would have thought it would have been. It's not. It's not. Who passes mitochondrial disorders on? My mother. Mamas. And mama don't have this problem. And it's different, different DNA. Right. It's a circular DNA. Mm -hmm. it's not so, but I still believe my dad and me have the same thing. Maybe, though, his was hypothyroidism, and that's why he had the eye droop. Mm -hmm. You know? I don't know. Which is genetic? Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of people have hypothyroidism, yeah. right? Yeah. Could have sent it to me recessively? No, 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 you got it from your mother, but he, kept, he could have gotten from the, you know, from the mother too. It's just been yeah. it just happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, let me ask this. If there's nine kids in the family and it's just me, that's not fair. It kind of sucks, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, ten, I mean, nine kids. I'm one, um, one of nine. Yeah, one of nine. But the others have, two other kids have Von Willebrand's disease. What's that? It's for me to know and you to look up. What's it called? Von Willebrand's. V O N. W I L L I B R A N D S. And four of us have the factor for it, and five of us do not have the factor for it. I think it's completely unrelated to this mitochondrial thing, because I don't have the factor for it. Are you on medication now for it? How do they. How for do the they, mitochondrial yeah. CPEO, the mito cocktail. So after I oh, learned, I was. And a proamatine episode happened. I was like, this sucks. I mean, mentally, I feel like I could do so much more, you know? And so I said to my husband, there's got to be another answer. And, I, you know, I went to other neurologists, and they were like, oh, that's way beyond my pay grade. I don't know anything about it. And so then I was like, God, there's got to be blah, blah, blah. Somebody's so pay grade I somewhere. just Googled mitochondrial disorders. <laughs> and, you know spent days searching and found a local geneticist and she did genetic testing on me and right away prescribed the mito cocktail and I was like why didn't anybody else tell me about this because I'm a lot better on the mito cocktail and when I don't take that mito cocktail every day I know I mean 800 milligrams of CoQ10 yeah. is a lot normal people take about a hundred per day right yeah a lot of people with Parkinson's, they're doing a lot of CoQ10 stuff with people with Parkinson's, and they're taking, like, high doses of it. Isn't CoQ10 good for your heart as well? Yes. Yeah. Well, your heart, it's the same. That's probably why. So the two things that this disease affects are this. So the doctor calls me from Emory Movement Clinic and, or Muscle Clinic, and he calls me over the phone and says, Yes, you have red ragged fibers, you have a mitochondrial disorder, that's it. 
And I was like, that's it? No medicine? No nothing? And he was like, well, just get an EKG every year because this will affect your heart. I'm like, thanks. I mean, you know, it's the limitation of medicine. I shouldn't take it out on the poor doctor. But I was like, come on, there's got to be something else here. Is that what caused your slow heart rate? Yeah, I think so. I think there is a connection there, but could there not be a connection to hypothyroidism? Is it all connected? This is a big philosophical argument here. Right. Have, right? I don't know. But the lesson for me is when all my girlfriends complain about whatever, I say, check your thyroid. Check your thyroid. I don't really, you know, because I think it's very underdiagnosed. Or there's a lot of people like me who are subclinical, but they don't meet the criteria for the lab values. And the best book I ever read that this psychologist turned me on to is called Life Extension Revolution. It's by a doctor named Philip Lee Miller. And he talks about all the lab values and how, like the lab value companies, you know, those values are set. I'm getting on my insurance conspiracy now. Because insurances don't want to pay for people who are subclinical. And they have to have some cut off, right? But you could be feeling like crap and and have a subclinical level of a blood chemistry, right? So anyway, he talks about in his research the values are much different than the lab value companies. So just a theory. And you know, the thyroid, if the thyroid is out of whack, may affect the blood pressure too. Yeah. Has your energy improved since taking the mitochondria or since taking your yes. thyroid? Both. Both. I think it's it's in concert. You know? But I mean, I, my heart rate pretty much runs in the 50s. And I'm not in shape, you could say. You know, in a high-performance athlete, you know, their, their heart rate could be 50-something, but 50-something for a heart rate isn't really... Is that because your muscles aren't contracting because they don't have the, the mitochondria, energy? maybe?